Hi, I'm Dr. Jared Gardner, and I am here today virtually with the awesome residents and fellows in pathology and dermatology at Mayo Clinic. Thank you guys for having me. We're going to look at some unknown cases. I often send um, uh, digital slides preview to, uh, to be previewed for cases, but I did not uh, have the time to get that together. So these are just some slides I pulled this morning, literally. Um, so we're going to do them totally cold, and we'll just talk through them and see what we can learn. So this is, um, I don't actually know where it is. I'm going to make this up. It was a lesion on like the, the hand of a, of a person, an adult person. Um, anyone have any ideas about what this might be? And again, no shame. You've not even previewed these slides. So say what you like and we'll just talk it out. It was probably black or purple clinically. Or a differential diagnosis. This looks like, um, it's got maybe some vascular channels Good. within it. Yes. Or kind of a loose stroma between. Good. What, uh, let's see, we'll, we'll reward that correct uh, description here with a closer look so you can see what's actually going on up close. Here's some of it. Here's some more. Sometimes getting too close up to a vascular lesion can be a little, little scary. It's just like in lots of things in pathology, especially most of derm paths, starting low is good. Get an idea of what you think it might be. If you think it might be benign or malignant, then go closer and take a look at the different players involved in the in the game. And then you can kind of get an idea of what actually is happening. But if you don't start with that low power, sometimes it can it can lead you astray. So like here we're dealing with something that's, you know, kind of in the dermis pushing up and probably has like either been either it's traumatized and ulcerated or it's been picked at. I mean, it looks like they've been the skin looks like it's been picked at. So it's probably been manipulated a bit. Mm -hmm. and, yeah, um, other concentrations would be something like angiokeratoma that was probably um, like uh, traumatized. And somebody mentioned muscle and tumor. I agree. That would be in a differential as well. Yes, good. I, I think um, Masson's tumor is exactly what is going on here, which the name sounds a little scarier than it should be. It's actually just a form of organizing thrombosis or papillary endothelial hyperplasia, or intravascular papillary endothelial hyperplasia is the other, other name for it. So um, Masson's tumor, though, was described by Masson, along with a ton of other stuff, which is why, I mean, I, I love the guy. He did a lot of great stuff for pathology, but you can't have your name on that many things, right? I think at the end of your life or career, you get to say one of your entities gets to keep your eponym, and then all the rest get named after somebody else. That's my, if I was making the rules, that's what the rules would be, okay? So in any case, though, Masson tumor is a, is an important concept for pathologists to recognize. I actually rarely ever actually put that term in my report. I use it, it it's helpful when we're talking about cases and it's really important to recognize this phenomenon, but it sounds kind of scary. In my reports, actually what I would call this is, and I like your point you brought up of angiokeratoma. It certainly could be. We can't, angiokeratoma has vessels that push up into the epidermis, right? And we can't really tell here because the epidermis is kind of obliterated over top of this thing. So it could either just be, a, I, honestly, probably this is a vascular malformation or, or a cavernous hemangioma, venous hemangioma. A lot of things we call hemangioma in, in the skin are actually probably forms of malformation. And people like to argue over that. But to me, it doesn't really matter. Benign vascular lesion, that's the main thing, especially for small solitary lesions. Sometimes the classification matters in large lesions, especially in babies, um, where that might actually change management if it's a type of hemangioma or a type of malformation. But for, for small lesions where this is probably biopsied for rule out melanoma, because it probably looked black and ulcerated as these as vascular lesions in the skin can. So, and we've got kind of a, a collarette. The epidermis is kind of scooping under it on both sides. That can happen in, in um, pyogenic granulomas, also known as lobular capillary hemangioma, although this wouldn't fit for that because it doesn't have small enough vessels. So anyway, what we do have here is we've got nice, obvious vascular spaces, and they are kind of big and dilated or cavernous. They're lined by bland endothelium. Sometimes the endothelium sticks into the lumen. We call that a hobnailing. Don't get too freaked out about hobnailing. People really fixate on that because there are a variety of, of uh, vascular things that are supposed to have hobnailing, like hobnail hemangioma or targetoid hemosiderotic hemangioma. I've got a video about that on my YouTube channel if you're curious to see some examples. Also, you can see hobnailing sometimes in angiosarcoma and some of the different hemangioendotheliomas, those vascular 
group of vascular tumors with intermediate malignant potential. But you see hobnailing in all sorts of benign vascular things. So don't worry, just because the cells are protruding into the lumen, that does not mean they're bad, okay? Don't freak out by that. And, um, but they are all very small. I don't see any big, ugly pleomorphic guys. It's a single thin layer. I don't see them piling on top of each other. In between, the cells actually look a little bigger and more plump in between. I bet that probably a lot of these are reactive myofibroblasts. They kind of have that bluish gray cytoplasm. So sometimes you see a variety of myofibroblasts in the background, especially if you've had traumatized, a traumatized lesion or there's been hemorrhage. It's kind of a repair sign, right? These are the kind of similar to the cytology of cells you'd see like in nodular fasciitis or granulation tissue, right? So that doesn't bother me at all. And if you did an actin stain here, you'd see, you don't need to do it, but you'd see a little wispy staining on these guys. And then the lining cells would be positive for CD31 or ERG or CD34, if you wanted to. I don't think any stains needed here, okay? So that all this stuff tells me that there's a benign vascular lesion here. Whether we want to call it a cavernous hemangioma or a benign vascular malformation doesn't really matter. It's a benign vascular something. And then, though, in the middle of it, we've got all this bright pink fibrin, right? So fibrin is filling up some of the vascular channels. And you can really see over here, right? It's like you can kind of see the outlines of those pre-existing vessels with the little, um, the little background fibrous tissue in between. And then the bright, let me get closer, sorry. I'm having trouble doing that without looking at the screen. Here is the fibrin, right? The smudgy pink stuff. And then compare that also, let me flip the condenser. Ah, look, this is a nice way to tell blood versus fibrin, by the way, if you're ever struggling. Blood is a brighter red. And if you flip your condenser, you can see the actual individual outlines of cells. Isn't that nice? So you can see little red cells all smashed together there. But in between this stuff, the more smudgy, homogenized pink stuff, that's fibrin, right? So there's a bunch of fibrin thrombus and red cells, and it's all tangled up with com compressed vascular walls. So when you look at this up close, that looks very scary, right? It looks busy, spindled. You could think, is that slit-like spaces? With Is that capacity? You could think all sorts of stuff. So that's why it's important to know this is only just an organizing thrombus in the middle of a benign vascular lesion. That's all this is here. But up close especially, it looks scary. So here's the trick to figuring this out. What happens is that, there, perfect. As the thrombus forms, thrombus can do what? Three things, basically. It can basically either dissolve and go away. The body lyses the thrombus. Or the thrombus totally organizes and scars down and blocks off the blood vessel. Or the third option is, both, uh, both happen, that you get basically areas that fibrose and scar down and organize, and then you get new vascular channels going through. That's what would happen like in a normal vessel. So the same kinds of things can happen when you get a thrombus in a benign vascular lesion like a hemangioma. And here what's happening is the endothelial cells are trying to kind of, I think of it, they're kind of trying to, to, to drill and work their way through and dig new tunnels, new vascular channels through this fibrin that's blocked off the blood flow here. And what in the process, little tiny islands of fibrin get, get left behind and wrapped around by individual endothelial cells. And those then, as the space opens back up, look like these little free-floating papillae, these little papillae, uh, papillary structures. And sometimes you'll find fibrin in the papillary core. And if you're lucky, you'll see an area of obvious fibrin transitioning into area with the little papillae. That's great. And then over time, I found that the areas with fibrin can become, see like here, it's transitioning. It's becoming like fibrosis. It's actually the fibrin's going away and it's being replaced with collagen and some, some fibroblasts and myofibroblasts, okay? And so when you see these little tiny islands lined by bland endothelial cells floating in the middle with fibrin in the background of a benign vascular lesion, that's Messon's tumor, papillary endothelial hyperplasia. And I know we're, we're belaboring the point, but the reason I want to bring up these little nitty gritty details is sometimes this can be very complex and very busy. And I have had multiple times where I've seen cases that were sent to me in the past. I used to take uh, consultation cases and I've had multiple times where stuff got sent to me because people were really worried that it was angiosarcoma or something because it looked very, very complex. So this gives the illusion of complexity. But what's happening, the key is that it does look busy and complex, but A, there's very little like tipia or none and b it's happening in the middle of pre-existing 
benign vascular spaces, sometimes in a big dilated blood vessel or in a vascular malformation, cavernous hemangioma. That's the kind of times I see it most. You can see it in other things, angiokeratomas, which can have a lot of overlap with the kinds of vessel spaces we see here. So it can happen in a variety of settings. It can kind of mimic the complexity of angiosarcoma, but it's inside pre-existing vessels, which is a place where you don't usually see angiosarcoma arising in the lumen of a vessel. Even though it's a vascular tumor, it usually arises in the skin without any pre-existing vessel that it's coming from. There are some rare exceptions, like in the great vessels around the heart, you can sometimes see intravascular forms of sarcoma that can have angiosarcoma component. That's a little outside of our scope today. So how I would sign this out in real life is I would probably just say hemangioma with organizing thrombus and ulceration or benign vascular malformation with organizing thrombus and ulceration. Benign. That way I'm not using complicated words that might be confusing depending on the, the, um, the knowledge level of my clinical colleagues. I mean, dermatologists are very familiar with Masson's tumor because it's taught in training, but some people in other fields may not know what this is and it might sound scary. Here, oh, this is, I should have picked this area. This is even better. Look at that fibrin up here at the top, all mangled together. And then as you go down, you can see the vascular channels are being formed there. And then individual little papillae wrapped by endothelial cells are broken free and are floating here in the vascular space. That is the perfect textbook example of Masson's tumor. Okay, great. Any questions? Actually, before there's questions, let me show you one other one I forgot I pulled. Here is a different example. Look, we're down somewhere deeper, right? I, would, I don't remember the history, but I bet we're also in the hand or the foot. Here we've got big, very large vascular spaces, okay? Surrounded by fibrosis and maybe even some, some muscle smooth wall, hard to tell. Then over here, whoa, 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 very busy. What is going on? It looks like infiltrative anastomotic channels. It makes you think it's an infiltrating tumor. But again, this is basically a very extensive, exuberant example of Masson's that's kind of probably been around a little longer. And it, instead of seeing good fibrin in between, a lot of these have actually become sclerotic collagen. There's probably some fibrin in there too. Sometimes I find it helpful to do, if I'm having trouble, you can do a, a vascular marker like a CD34. I find that actually, even though it's not my favorite vascular marker for vascular tumors, um, it's a pretty good marker for things that are very busy and inflamed because it does it, it's very clean in that setting. Um, CD31 stains histiocytes, so it's kind of a little bit more messy. ERG stains, but it's a nuclear stain. So I find that like in, in busy, inflamed kind of things where I want to see the pattern of the vessels, 34 can be quite nice there. And you can also use um, a trichrome stain because it can kind of help highlight the different components, what's actually fibrin, what's actually collagen. Um, it doesn't always change the diagnosis, but sometimes it can make a very busy, confusing picture look a little cleaner with some practice. So you might try that out like for, for educational purposes at some point. But see, look here. That other stuff looked like it's college, but in here, I feel like we're getting some pink fibrin. And so these are all papillae. They're just all packed really close together. And again, the key is, A, I don't see any atypia here. And B, when I go back to low power, it looked all busy and scary, but what's it doing? It's sitting in the lumen of a big dilated vessel, probably a vascular malformation or something like that. And there's more of the... There you can see the papillae actually floating, kind of like we saw in that previous case. But when they're all packed together, can look pretty scary, right? And my understanding, I've not read the original paper, but my understanding is that Masson described it as something that kind of mimicked angiosarc, but was in a, va a vascular space. And here, oh, you can see there, beautiful, look at that. Fibrin thrombus, kind of got a granulation tissue feel with plump myofibroblasts in there, and endothelial cells mixed together, and you're seeing that transition right over here into the papillary bodies, the little papillary structures. So very, two, two different examples of Masson's tumor, and again, I would sign this one out probably as a vascular malformation. I mean, probably that's what it is. I mean, it might be one big dilated, like an aneurysm or something, but probably makes more sense that it's a part of a malformation um, and that it's got an extensive organizing thrombus in it. All right, and there's more fibrin there that's not really organized at all. All right, any questions? Messon's too. We're going to get about three cases done in this hour, guys, but we're going to get them done really well. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate that laugh. That was good. Pity laughs are okay, too. All right. So let's see what we think about this lesion. Okay. Any ideas?
What you think? On the low power, it looks like a verrucous lesion, but I think this is vascular too, and now this could be something like angiokeratoma. Very good, yes, and I like that point. It is verrucous. It does have a verruca-like appearance from low power, but then when we get closer, we see all these big dilated vascular channels in the papillary dermis pushing all the way up into the epidermis to the point that they're basically almost completely entrapped in the epidermis, right? They, they bulge all the way up into the epidermis and get wrapped around by epidermis. And they are aligned by a very, very thin layer of bland, flattened endothelial cells, right? And you can see up here, it looks, sometimes it's hard to tell, is that an artifact filled with blood, an a, a artifactual space or a real vessel? We'll go look at the edge and see if we can see. See, we see those are the basal keratinocytes here of the epidermis. Then there's a thin, thin band of collagen, very subtle. See, there's a thin layer of basement membrane or something right here. And then on the inside of that is a little layer of endothelial cells. You can see maybe a little bit better down at the bottom. There's an endothelial cell, see? So that is a good example. This is a great example of angiokeratoma, kind of an unusual variant. Where'd it go? Oh, verrucous angiokeratoma, if you like. And you can have verrucous variants of angiokeratoma or of regular hemangioma. There's such a thing as a verrucous hemangioma. And I'm not sure if this is a reactive change. I'm sure this has been published. I just can't remember, um, or either I've read it, forgotten, or haven't read it. But I don't know if this is actually due to the person scratching or picking at it, or if this is a, an unusual change induced by the vessels underneath. I'm not sure, okay? So that's a nice angiokeratoma, and look what's going on over here. Organizing thrombus. This looks a lot more like granulation tissue, but see it's filling up the lumen of this vessel. And even over here, if I recall, there's some more. There's more fibrin there. The other is more organized that we just looked at. This is kind of earlier, more fibrin, but it's already starting to get some endothelial cells and myofibroblasts kind of streaming through there, trying to organize it. And I want to say, maybe it was the other piece, no, it's the same thing. So basically that, that could go on to make a little area, a little focus of papillary endothelial hyperplasia. All right, the other thing I'd point out here is, what's going on over here? Anyone know what that is? Is that like keratin plugging? Oh, yeah, that is. You're right. But that's, I was actually thinking more like this, but you're absolutely right. This follicle is kind of plugged up with keratin, but look at this. If I show you this piece, it'll make it a little easier. Perhaps. So this is an incidental, this is probably unrelated. There's two different things here. There's some dermal edema. Yeah, there I mean, is. Like amyloid or something like that. It almost like has a lichen sclerosis type of look. Good. It is. It, it is have. very good. It is lichen sclerosis. This is lichen sclerosis. This was from the vulva. So this was a angiokeratomas are common in the genital region. Mm -hmm. So this was a person who had an angiokeratoma that was kind of verrucous, mm -hmm. and perhaps that's related to their background. They have lichen sclerosis also, and so in lichen sclerosis, you usually get. The classic finding is atrophy of the epidermis, sometimes with some uh, dying keratinocytes, because this starts out as a lichenoid interface process where lymphocytes attack the basal layer and some of them die. And then it kind of burns its way down and it leaves a wasteland of sclerotic collagen that's very homogenized and looks almost like amyloid. Exactly. There's a People have asked me to make a video of, of amyloid versus all the other pink things, and I keep putting it off because it's, it's a thing that I still struggle with in practice, all the smudgy pink stuff is is challenging but i'll I, it's working its way towards the top of my list so i'll get there eventually and then down below the sclerotic band you see usually an infiltrate of lymphocytes and sometimes histiocytes um, that kind of uh, mingle along there sometimes the histiocytes can get kind of an interstitial pattern between the collagen particularly it looks almost like granuloma annulari um, you particularly tend to see that on the uh, extra genital lichen sclerosis, but sometimes in the genital ones you can see. We we published a paper about that a couple years ago. So um, I like that you brought up edema because sometimes the sclerotic collagen, I would say actually relatively often, the sclerotic collagen in lichen sclerosis gets very pale and very edematous. And I don't exactly understand why that is, but it often has edema there. And you'll often find pigment incontinence. Look, I see some little melanophages up here, a little scattered dropped out melanin. So that's a common finding. So this is a very, very good example of lichen sclerosis here. 
And lichen sclerosis does tend to get atrophic, thus the name lichen sclerosis et atrophicus and atrophic in Latin, but not always. So sometimes you get hypertrophy of the epidermis. Now here, I think the hypertrophy is probably more related to that for rucous um, angiokeratoma next door, but you can sometimes see thinning and other times you can see thickening. And if you see a lot of thickening, always be on the lookout for any atypia along the basal layer. If you start seeing a lot of atypia, there is a form of dysplasia in lichen sclerosis sometimes called a differentiated vulvar intraepithelial neoplasia or DVIN. It's very tricky and subtle and hard to diagnose. Um, I will probably make a video or something about that in the future, but that's something that I still struggle with, but it uh, does have a tendency to go on to invasive squamous cell carcinoma. So I always look carefully at lichen sclerosis cases to make sure I'm not missing background dysplasia and it's not HPV associated. It's related to the lichen sclerosis, we think. So uh, verrucous angiokeratoma with some organizing thrombus, there's a little bit more, plus background lichen sclerosis, which is a good lesson. Don't stop after you get one diagnosis, right? I always try, on shaves especially, sometimes when I look at the beginning, I see this is the lesion, but I try to make myself look around the edges first, because I know once I go fixate on figuring out what the lesion is, if it's a complicated or interesting case, sometimes I'll forget to go back and look at those edges. So I know that, so I try to always screen around the edges first to make sure there's not some subtle background thing. You have to do it the way it works for you. But I find that for me, that helps. That way I'm reassured that, okay, this is the main thing here. Now I can figure out what's going on. So I try to, I try to do it that way in my practice personally. So good, good example of a two for one on the same uh, slide. All right. So we're clearly on the, the trunk here because we've got like a mile thick of dermis, really massive dermis. And here's something abnormal. Any take the lymphangioma version? Yeah, good. This looks great for lymphangioma, right? Um, it looks a lot like, except for the verruca stuff, it looks similar to angiokeratoma, I think. I, I find that if you, uh, that uh, angiokeratoma and lymphangioma are always in the differential diagnosis together for me, okay? If the, because sometimes you can get the lymphangioma channels can get trapped in the epidermis almost exactly like angiokeratoma. The main thing is, is if, if they're filled with this pink proteinaceous lymph fluid with very few red cells, more likely they're lymphatic. And if they're packed full of red cells or have fibrin thrombus, well, then more likely they're vascular. You can if you need to, you can solve that. You could do a D240 or a podoplanin, right, which will stain lymphatic endothelium um, and will not stain the vascular endothelium. It usually doesn't really matter. I mean, they're both benign things. So, so, um, but if you need to do it, you can. I would say that the the rule about the blood and the the um, the pink stuff doesn't always work. Sometimes you can get channels that have pink, frothy stuff that looks like lymph in a vascular lesion and sometimes you can have vascular lesions where the blood washes out of the channel and makes it look empty so it doesn't always work but if i find something that's extensively filled with pink stuff like this and little blood that's usually going to make me favor uh, a lymphangioma okay so lymphangioma circumscriptum is one name that gets applied to these but i would say that we often think about them as being here in the papillary dermis but look at this case When we go down, we can see there's actually quite a few lymphatic channels in here, kind of dissecting through the, the um, dermis and all the way down into the subcutis. And they're all the same. They're all lined by a thin layer of bland endothelial cells. They do look a little bit complex and busy, but no atypia. And even though they kind of, I hate to say the word infiltrate, even though they're like patchy around through the dermis and subcutis, they're not the, the kind of channels like you'd see in an angiosarc, which would have much more atypia and actually individual little channels digging through the tissue. These are kind of big channels that are just mixed up with the tissue. And the thing is, is that I feel like a lot of things that look like lymphangioma circumscriptum on top Actually, if you get a deeper biopsy, a lot of times I find that there's a deeper component of lymphatics underneath. So that's because probably a lot of these are a type of malformation. See, again, we call them lymphangioma, but probably many of them are actually lymphatic malformations. They commonly present in babies, either at birth or in early childhood. And um, because there's this deeper component in a fair number of them, they can sometimes grow back because of that, even though they're benign. So um, don't let the, you know, malformations, whether lymphatic or vascular, are going to look um, not nicely organized. They're going to be like vessels in the middle mixed in with the tissue, but uh, they're very bland 
and the lining looks totally benign. And sometimes you'll find oh, the whole thing looks lymphatic and then you'll find a couple things that look more like veins. And so I think that sometimes malformations can be a mixture, you know, of, of lymphatic channels, of venous channels, sometimes of arterial channels. I personally don't get too hung up on how to subclassify. Some people really like to nitpick over that. I, I don't feel like usually it's going, as long as it's not going to be clinically meaningful for that case, I don't get too fixated on it. Um, and uh, these are common in skin, but you can sometimes see them in organs too. Like I've seen, I've seen them in the mesentery before, a big lymphangioma, lymphatic malformation in the mesentery. And occasionally you'll see, ah, oh, there it is. Occasionally you'll see lymphocytes hanging out with the lymphatics. They can either be floating as a little cluster in the lumens, or sometimes they'll be in the walls or the soft tissue around the channels. Even I've seen like ones that look almost like little lymphoid aggregates, like germinal centers. So that's a, uh, that's something to be aware of, that that's totally fine if you encounter that. So lymphangioma slash lymphatic malformation, benign, and a good thing to, uh, to recognize. And you hear some smooth muscle around it here. See some kind of disorganized smooth muscle around it. That's fine. All right. This might go without saying, but if these happen to evolve, the you know, biopsy borders, especially to the deep, maybe they didn't get very, very deep on there. Do you do you recommend they re-excise? Um, the... Personally, I don't. That's a good question. Um, I because they're benign. That is, there going to be more underneath? I mean, maybe. Is it going to grow back? Maybe. But is it going to like turn into something bad? I mean, extremely unlikely, right? I mean, I I don't know. Maybe someone's reported. A malignant transformation of this, but I'm not aware of it personally. But there's a lot of literature I still have not read yet. So, so no, I don't. I just say this is a benign lymphatic malformation slash lymphangioma, and then kind of leave it up to them um, to decide what to do. Because also the other thing I feel like is a problem when you have malformations is what's the margin? Like the aorta? I mean, like the, of course there's got to be a vessel that goes to the edge, even if I can't see it, because it's got to get blood or lymph into it somehow, right? And I'm not, I'm not trying to be tongue in cheek. I just mean I've often wondered that, like. What's the meaningful extent of margin in a benign vascular thing like this? In a malignant thing, that's a different story, right? Where you actually have a neoplasm that is distinct from the background vasculature. But here, I mean, it's hard to tell, you know, what exactly is part of the lesion versus what's background, you know, lymphatic channels. So, but that's a great question. No, I personally don't. Um, if they said they needed to know and they wanted to know for clinical purposes, I'd be happy to tell them if I thought it was positive or not. But I do not routinely report margins on these. Um, the one, the one thing I would point out, and we don't have time to go into it, but I do have a short video on my channel about it, is if you see something that looks like lymphangioma and it's at a radiated site like the breast, what is the main thing that you have to think about there? I mean, angiosarcoma, but assuming that there's no real atypia, but it looks lymphangioma-like, but the patient had radiation a few years ago. Atypical vascular lesion. As yes, well. very good. AVL, atypical vascular lesion, which is a name, no offense to the people who named it, but I, I personally don't really love it because they usually don't have atypia or not much atypia. They kind of are a little bit complex and they look like lymphangioma-like. Most of them, there's a lymphatic type, then there's another type that's more vascular looking. Again, we don't have time to go there. But basically, anything I see that looks like a lymphangioma and they've had a history of radiation, or if it's on the breast, I will actually go, even if they didn't tell me there's radiation, I want to specifically find out personally if there's a history of radiation because I've had times before where no one told me. They said like rule out SEV or something like that. And I said, oh, it looks like a lymphangioma. And they're like, oh, well, you know, could it have anything to do with their radiation? And I was like, ah, why didn't you tell me that? Yes, yes, it could. So in a radiated site, if it looks lymphangioma, I'm almost always going to call that a post-radiation atypical vascular lesion. And again, you can go check out that video on my channel. It's a kind of complicated um, area. Most of them seem to be benign. There are rare exceptions that progress to angiosarcoma, but most of them seem benign. And But then there's debate over what to do about them. Sometimes they're multiple. But anyway, just know... That, that that lesion AVL can look almost identical, to me identical even, to uh, lymphangioma. So the, the main history is knowing they've been radiated or seeing radiation change in the dermis, which you don't always see, sometimes you do. So just know that that's another thing to keep in your differential here of the, of the uh, lymphangioma, angiokeratoma pattern, is keep those things in your differential. All right. Now, it was not all gonna be blood vessel things, we're gonna change gears. So even though this is a shave, this was actually um, a, a dermatosis, a rash-like process. Um, 
And I could tell you the history, but here I'm not going to. I'm just going to say the history is uh, rule out dermatitis. Because that's kind of like the real world. A fair number of times depend on who's sending the biopsy. Sometimes you get very good clinical info. And sometimes you get rule out dermatitis or rule out lesion. So, you know, you have to decide when you need to track more info down and what to do about it. So I'll let you guys just kind of take a look as I scroll along here. And I've noticed this is a new trend. In the past, I said, oh, a punch usually, if it's from a dermatologist, punch usually means they want a rash. Shave usually means they want an individual lesion. But that's kind of changing, unfortunately. I've, I've noticed in the past just two or three years, a lot more people doing shaves for, for rashes or dermatoses, which is not always inappropriate. There are times, though, that I really would like to see the deep dermis. Um, and without that, I can still give you information. But if I don't see the deep dermis, you know, I, I, I don't know if there's deep inflammation and sometimes that changes what I favor. So as long as people are uh, okay with that, then that's fine. Like, um, and it, the benefit of a shave is it does give me a lot more of the epidermis to look at, which sometimes can be helpful, depends on what you're looking for. If, if they want roll out paniculitis and you give me a shave, guess what? You're not getting a helpful answer for me because I'm going to tell you, I can't evaluate for paniculitis if I don't see the subcutis. Okay. All right. So anyone want to take a a thought or tell me what they're thinking about here. Even like what's the pattern? Because in inflammatory dermopaths, you start with saying what the main pattern is or what the mixture of patterns are. And then we can narrow down the differential based on the clinical or other features. In the epidermis, there's like mounts of para, like clusters of para. Uh, Parakeratose is not everywhere in all sections. Yeah. It's a little bit spongiotic. Um, there's a bit mild per vascular superficial inflammation. Good. And altogether, I think somebody mentioned PTS rosea. I think that's a good thought, especially with uh, mounts of para and spongiosis and per vascular um, lymphocytic inflammation combination. Okay, pityriasis rosea. Yeah, that's a very fair thought because there is some sponge in this case. And the epidermis, does it look uh, regular thickness or thicker or thinner? Irregularly acanthotic. Yeah, regular acanthosis. I agree. There's a regular acanthosis, and there's areas of kind of para. Some of it's mounded up, and some is ortho. Let me see. If yeah, I'm... maybe PIP is a concentration of uh, That would be the... about it. Yeah, yes, I see that'd now. Be the other thing. Good. like a checkerboard. Good. The regular acanthosis. Yep. Yeah, so pityriasiform lesions, which for, for the, anyone path listening to this, pityriasiform is like that point where you're just like, uh, derm path terms, right? And I agree. Pit, pityriasis, I think, means brand-like, like, you know, flaky, like little, like, brand from, uh, from, like, grain that they used to make cereal with. So it's kind of old-timey term. And it's because they kind of have little, like, flakes on them clinically. So a variety of diseases have the word pityriasis in them because they can have that kind of flaky scale on them clinically. Microscopically, a lot of the diseases that have the pityriasis in their name tend to have little foci of parakeratosis. It's sometimes the patterns are a little different, but they can either have little mounds, like little, little like hills made of para, and then going back to ortho, or they can have like loose like flakes kind of coming off of para, kind of like we have here, okay? So when you see sponge with little mounds of para, and if you see a little red cells, which we see here, although it's hard to know if those red cells are from the biopsy or real, you could think of pityriasis rosea. But once I see the acanthosis, a kind of a regular acanthosis, and I'm seeing a lot more scale here, in the right clinical setting, I certainly would be uh, thinking that this might be pityriasis rubropilaris, or PRP. And I really like the people use the word checkerboard to describe the alternating ortho and para. I'm trying to get the get it to show up there. You can see it if I flip the condenser. See, you can see the nuclei there. There's para, then below it is ortho, then below it is para. And so it's up and down alternating and side to side alternating. But the problem is, is to me, a checkerboard should be like perfect squares that are like red and black. I'm a very concrete thinker. My wife is a psychiatrist and she says that my, I don't have really great abstract thought. So I like things to look exactly like they're supposed to be. So what other, you, and I've, I've mentioned this before, you've used the visual terminologies that work for your mind, your way of seeing stuff. And that's what matters, right? So to me, I like the other people have used the term notes on a scale, that this looks like kind of like notes uh, going up and down the scale. And maybe you're like a classically trained musician and you are, you know, think that's an abomination to describe this way. And that's okay. So, but in any case, I think that this, like the para kind of goes up and goes down and it's mingled in between ortho. 
The other thing that some people like to say is like a teapot, like a tea kettle lid, like lifting off of the epidermis, like a little flake of para is kind of flipped away and it's breaking away from the epidermis. So any of the, if you have irregular acanthosis with any of those kind of patterns of para, always think about pityriasis rubropilaris. You could think about psoriasis here too, but psoriasis is usually going to have more uniform elongated reedy, and usually the granular layer is going to be wiped out in psoriasis, unless they've had it partially treated, in which case sometimes they get some granular layer back. But um, if you t the, the granular layer in PRP is often kind of alternating. There's some granular layer, some areas with it lost, but you usually have plenty of granular layers still there. And then the other thing, where was it? I think it's better on this one. Yeah. Is in PRP, you oftentimes get kind of some plugging of the follicles with some keratin, and para kind of mounds up at the edge of the follicle, kind of. We say that shoulder, shoulder parakeratosis. Para. Yeah, very good. So you can see that in PRP. You can also see kind of shoulder parakeratosis in seborrheic dermatitis too. So none of these features are totally 100% specific. That's the, the thing that's frustrating and maddening about um, uh, inflammatory or rash type uh, dermatopathology. It, there is some spongiosis here and a little bit more inflammation than usual. So I don't know maybe if they have a little bit of contact dermatitis superimposed, but in any case, um, it would not be wrong at all to think about a spongiotic process um, here. And uh, sometimes they can also have a little fo focal acanthalysis in the epidermis. I don't think that this case has any. So clinically, though, if I recall, this patient had uh, erythematous plaques that were on their trunk and had islands of sparing that were kind of surrounded, the erythema surrounding normal skin and palmoplantar thickening of the skin, keratoderma, PPK. So those, of course, are the classic clinical features for, for PRP. But there are multiple PRP types. I still don't have a good handle on all the different types. The main thing I think to take home is that if you see something with it, these combo of features, it's worth at least raising the possibility, even if you don't have good clinical info, saying there are some features here that could fit with PRP in the right clinical setting. The reason is that PRP is treated differently, right? A lot of things get you know treated with you know uh, steroids or other sort of anti-inflammatory agents, but PRP usually the my understanding is one of the main treatments is retinoid therapy, okay? So if you're between psoriasis and PRP, sometimes I'll say psoriasform dermatitis and then say, well, I favor it's psoriasis, but you know, there's some areas that could fit with PRP and that way they can decide either to treat it with a therapy that covers both. Like I believe I've heard that methotrexate does, although I don't, I don't treat this, so I don't know. I'm not an expert at treatment. Um, but, uh, or they could trial one drug and see if the patient gets better. And then it's always in the back of their mind, like, oh, he did say it looked a little like PRP. So maybe we should try retinoids. So I like to bring up when I, when I sign out rash biopsies, I like to bring up, here's what I think it is and that fits with your clinical, but also there's some features that made me think about this other stuff that doesn't seem to fit as well clinically, but at least it's there in the differential in case the process evolves later. So it's very different from uh, looking at tumors or lesions, right? Where we're looking at a snapshot picture, sometimes of the whole lesion removed. It doesn't evolve, right? Usually, I mean, hopefully not, unless it recurs or metastasizes or something. Whereas rashes are very different, right? They can try a treatment, the patient comes back, it may look different, it may have gotten worse, it may have gotten better. So that dynamic process makes it a little bit different thing to kind of approach, which I think makes it a struggle for us as pathology trained people to learn it's kind of a different pattern of reporting and giving the dermatologist the things they want. I have a whole video about how to report inflammatory derm path, which arguably PRP is not truly inflammatory. It's kind of more of a keratinization problem is what I've heard some people who know more about this than me say. But in any case, uh, this one was clinically PRP, pityriasis rubropilaris. All right, so from 2x, what kind of things could we think about here? I think you're going to have kind of a broad differential. Hmm. Maybe infectious? I could definitely think. What kind of infectious? Cryptococcus? Yeah, for sure. At low power, right away, you could think crypto could look very much like this, right? It can make these little, little dots with white space around it where the mucoid capsule was, right? And so as we go closer, though, we can sort out, don't think that's what's going on, but definitely that, that silhouette is reminiscent of some cases of crypto I've seen. Very good. So we'll go all the way in. Now, what could these cells be? One of the other thoughts we had was renal cell or stomach. Renal cell is always good to think of when you see pale or clear cells in the dermis. And... These are pretty bland, small nuclei, but sometimes renal cell can be pretty bland. I mean, there I've seen ugly ones, but I've also seen ones where they didn't have a ton of atypia. 
So it's not wrong to think of renal cell um, in this setting. Okay, what other things can make clear cell? So I'd like to leave this in because I think it's a good differential to discuss what can make clear cells that fill the dermis. I guess that's the xanthoma category. Absolutely. These can be foam. They look foamy even, right? I don't have a higher power than this to show you. I rarely need to use a 60, but every once in a while that'll help you see things. If I flip though, you can kind of see, if I flip my condenser, that they have little tiny bubbles, little clear vacuoles. And in some places you can see them indenting and like scalloping into or pushing into the nuclear border, like right there, right? See that? It's kind of very, it's very subtle. It's hard to pick up on this, um, this view, unfortunately. But there are little tiny bubbles denting in, okay? So yeah, xanthoma. Oh, there, that's even better. Oh, well, and then I move past it. See right there? So you can see like it's scooping out like a sharp little divot into the nucleus. So yeah, they look, that would be really great for xanthoma, right? But... What now? Balloon cell nevus? Or yeah, balloon cell? good. This is a balloon cell nevus, and this is the most ballooned balloon cell nevus I've probably ever seen. The Like the whole, usually balloon cell change which is this kind of pale, frothy, bubbly, foamy, it kind of kind of run a range between granular to vacuolated, like this cytoplasm in nevus cells. You can also see similar changes in melanoma too. So balloon cell doesn't mean benign or malignant. It's just a change that melanocytes can undergo sometimes. I feel like I much more often see it in nevi, but usually it's a little focal change. This one is extensively, extensively balloon cell change. And it's only up here at the top where you can see there are actually nests of melanocytes. And I know I've often taught online, for those of you who follow any of my stuff on social media, that dark cells, dark brown cells, usually are not melanocytes. Well, sometimes the rules aren't followed. Like these, this is a cluster of melanocytes. Even though they've got a lot of brown in them, they're melanocytes. These really dark guys are probably melanophages, I would bet, right there, there, there. But the other cells, they do have a kind of darker than usual pigment. And you can see right here in this nest, See, it's starting to get balloon cell change. That's usually what we see. We see a few little balloon cell, and sometimes the vacuoles are bigger, and they look almost like sebocytes. And some people point out a difference in sebocyte-like change versus balloon cell change. I kind of lump it all together personally, but, um, but I know very smart people who, do, who like to split that out. The point of this is, this doesn't mean anything. This is benign nevus, right? The point of this is um, make sh to know that, that nevus and occasionally melanoma can have cytoplasmic changes that look so very unmelanocyte life look very different right so if we weren't sure uh, immunostain could easily but yeah if i looked at this i my first thought second or third thought maybe would not be balloon cell nevus i would have thought it's some form of xanthoma probably renal cell might have crossed my mind pecomas in the skin super rare uh, mesenchymal tumor can they're not quite like this but they can look a little bit you could think a little of granular cell tumor uh, from a little lower power although they're usually more pink and then up close they look they have a, gra a grainy little tiny dots in the cytoplasm rather than little tiny bubbles, but it's a little hard to show that subtlety over the, the screen here. But yeah, so this is a very dramatic balloon cell nevus. Pretty cool, huh? Benign and beautiful, as my favorite. All right. Uh, rule out melanoma clinically, dark spot, Sun damage to, I think it was on the back of a 60-year-old with sun damage, something like that. What you think? Solar lentigo, flat separate keratosis. Very good, yeah. This is either from here, lentigo or a seb, which honestly, flat seb and solar lentigo to me, like exist on a spectrum oftentimes. You see, it looks just like lentigo, then suddenly it gets a little couple horn pseudocysts, and it doesn't matter what you call it. Clinically, they want to know, is this an atypical melanocytic thing in the sun-damaged skin, which is going to get handled differently than one of these benign keratinocyte things that has pigment? And even though, for anyone who don't, doesn't recognize, even though these dark things look like nests, when we look closer, they are not nests. Those are actually little tips of reedy that are very darkly pigmented. They're actually keratinocytes, and you can actually do a stain to prove this. You do SOX10, most of them will be negative. There'll be some little scattered melanocytes, but the dark cells are going to be positive for keratin or P. P63, P40, if you wanted to. With practice, you'll be able to recognize this. It's a very characteristic look. Um, and don't stop looking for melanoma because sometimes melanoma blends into the background. People that get melanomas from sun damage, they get lentigos too. So it's I've seen cases where there's AK, lentigo, and melanoma all in the same biopsy many times. 
So um, in any case, though, the uh, like if you look closer, actually, and I just released a video about lentigo versus lentigo maligna, which is a type of melanoma in situ the other day. Uh, on YouTube, but see there, that's that's actually the melanocyte right there. It's got pink cytoplasm. Paradoxically, it's not the pigment itself. These dark pigmented guys, they're keratinocytes. They eat up the melanin from the, the melanocyte that makes it, and then the keratinocytes eat it up and hoard it and just keep it there for themselves. And I've got some other videos about melanocytes versus keratinocytes that go into that in more detail. So, okay, boring. Why am I showing you a solar lentigo? Well, this looks like a solar lentigo to me also, but I was a little surprised as I looked around, I started seeing dying keratinocytes. See these little bright pink cells? Now, if you get an inflamed solar lentigo or an inflamed anything, if you get lichenoid inflammation in a lentigo, in an AK, in a squame, a seb, whatever, you're going to get interface change, vacuoles, and dying keratinocytes at the basal layer mostly. But here, most of the dead keratinocytes are kind of like in the spinous layer. You see them, guys? Pink, 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 pink. And I looked over here. There's more of them. I thought this is kind of curious. What's, gonna, what's causing these pink dying keratinocytes in the back. Oh, there's a lot more over here. Look, there's even like a little cluster over here. Anyone have an idea what might be going on here? Kind of an unusual pattern. In a truck with sunburn. Yes, this is sunburn. Very good. And I was telling, I was telling my trainee at the time, I remember when this case happened and I said, you know, I wonder if this is a sunburn because sunburn can cause scattered dying keratinocytes kind of particularly the way I've learned it at least is up in the kind of spinous uh, layer rather than down at the basal layer. And I got, thankfully, there was a clinical photo. And yes, there was a dark black spot there, a dark brown spot that was the lentigo. And the back of the whole patient was like bright red sunburn, like diffuse sunburn all over the place. And it was very satisfying because I see this sometimes and think, oh, maybe it's sunburn cells, but I often don't have a picture or don't know. And then in this case, thankfully, I had a picture and I was like, look, we have proof it's sunburn cells. So now you've seen it. This is what sunburn does to your skin, kills those keratinocytes right in the middle, and over the long term, of course, creates a bunch of that blue-gray solar elastosis, which damages the collagen and pushes it out of the, or doesn't damage it, pushes the normal collagen out of the way, and of course, that's where wrinkles come from, um, in addition to the skin cancer risk, that's the cosmetic background. So if you happen to be watching this on YouTube and you're a patient, this is why people tell you to not get a bunch of sun exposure, because it damages a lot of different parts of your skin. It can cause big problems. So. There's your public service announcement for the day. Sunburn cells plus solar lentigo. And actually, I think I did report this and said, oh, there's some dying keratinocytes which could be compatible with sunburn, um, acute sunburn in the background of the solar lentigo. Ooh, and a bonus. One of my favorite little bonus findings, I did not report this because I usually don't, but does anyone know what that is? Something like epidermolytic hyperkeratosis. Yeah, this is EHK, epidermolytic hyperkeratosis. Just We see little foci of it, and they're due to keratin 1 and 10 mutations, probably just in the little stem cell that grows that area of the skin. Sometimes people have this as a germline problem, in which case they get an ichthyosis. But I see little foci of this, like, daily, basically. And it's not, not no need to report it. But in any case, I do have epidermolytic hyperkeratosis. I have videos about that if you're interested to see much more uh, detail about it. But it's kind of vacuolated pale keratinocytes, it looks like the epidermis is falling apart and then it gets some kind of funny granules and some uh, para over top of it. But it's a good thing to know about because sometimes people see it and they're like, what the heck is that? And once you know about it, it's easy to recognize. Just an incidental finding that's kind of kind of interesting. All right, so we can get a couple more in before we're out of time. Whoa, look at that. A rare bird right here. Little papule on the nose. Anyone? Yeah, right. This is a like the textbook fibrofolliculoma. It's a, a little papule, and it's made of dense, dense collagen with bland spindle cells. And embedded in that is a tangled up, kind of twisted bit of hair follicle, benign hair follicle. So like most hair follicle proliferations, each one looks a little different, right? They're like snowflakes is what Ron Rapini says, that every follicular tumor looks a little different from the next. And I think that's a very apt way to think of them. Um, this is a lesion that I often think about, but rarely encounter. And so I think it's, to me, the things, the three things I kind of put in the differential is fibrofolliculoma, um, trichodiscoma, if you believe in it, which I know it really exists, but I, I kind of am a little doubter about it, and fibrous papule, aka angiofibroma, because they all have their little bumps on the nose oftentimes, 
dense sclerotic collagen with bland spindle to kind of triangle shaped cells embedded in it. So if you see nice follicle in it, I call it fibrofolliculoma. If I don't see any or I just see normal follicles, it, sometimes they get trapped in a uh, angiofibroma, fibrous papule, then I call it fibrous papule. Trichodiscoma is supposed to have just some subtle epithelium, but I promise you, I, I don't think I've ever made a definitive diagnosis of trichodiscoma in uh, nine years of practice. Because every time I try to, I either cut deeper and I find fibrofolliculoma, or I cut deeper and I decide, well, there's not really any epithelium there. I think it's just a fibrous papule. So maybe smarter people out there can tell me what I'm doing wrong, but I kind of feel like it's one of those things that if it exists, it's vanishingly rare, or maybe it's just a funny cut of a fibrofolliculoma. And it's benign either way, and uh, sometimes these are associated with certain things, and but both of them are, so it doesn't, it doesn't uh, matter. What's the association that sometimes if you have m multiple fibrofolliculomas or trichodiscomas, what can you think of? Hog debate. Yeah, bird hog debate, which does have a, a risk of, of uh, renal cell carcinoma, right, and some other things. So uh, good, to, good to know about that and keep in mind. But when solitary lesion, I would just say fibrofolliculoma, and if I was signing it out for a non-dermatologist, I'd say it's a benign hair follicle tumor. All right. Here was a, let's see if I can get that. It's a little faded, but there, that's better. Now they took this out. This is like on the scalp. Polypoid lesion. And basaloid. What's going on here? What is this? There's some like red granular stuff in here. Anyone know what these red granules are? Look at this. Oh, yeah, good. I'll say I'll give you a hint. Here's a normal follicle, and they look just like that. Those are trichohyaline granules, right? We get keratohyaline granules or the purple granules at the top of the epidermis. In the inner root sheath of a hair follicle, we get bright red granules that are called trichohyaline granules. And what we have here is a lesion that has bright red trichohyaline granules plus some palisading plus some blue basaloid cells. So this is a hair follicle, a lesion with hair follicle differentiation. But it's a little hard to tell, like, what kind of differentiation. It's got stuff that looks like the, the kind of outer root sheath with the palisading. It's got little blue cells that look very much like a hair root. It's almost like making, like, little tiny hairs, but they're not really well formed. And they're all kind of uh, tangled together here and smashed into the epidermis. So they're not growing, like, in the growth pattern of, say, uh, a trichofolliculum, where you have the central cystic space that empties at the top and little hairs coming into it. This kind of like stuck on plaque onto the epidermis made of, of inner root sheath, outer root sheath, uh, matrical or root type cells, the little, uh, the little round blue cells that look kind of like the, the root of the hair follicle, the kind of cells you see in a, a pilomatricoma. And then up here at the top, they have stuff that looks like epidermis or what we call like the infundibulum. So kind of all the different types of hair follicle differentiation. So if you had to name a tumor like this and it was benign, what would you call it? Panfolliculoma? Yeah, this is a panfolliculoma, or my idea of one. And there's kind of two main flavors of panfolliculoma described. The superficial type, which is I think what this is, where it's stuck onto the epidermis, kind of the configuration similar to like a seborrheic keratosis, stuck onto the epidermis, kind of thickened epidermis, made of all the different types of hair follicle differentiation. And I find one of the most helpful things is it looks blue and basaloid, and then I start finding trichohyaline granules. I find that really helpful because you know, infundibular part of the hair follicle looks like epidermis. The root part can look kind of like basal cell or other things. It's those, those red granules that tells me, oh, this is inner root sheath. Now you can also see, I've seen inner root sheath differentiation in, in true basal cell carcinomas and other tumors. But if I see a lot of stuff with, with all these different types of immature but benign looking hair follicle component, panfolliculoma. It's also been described as a deeper cystic lesion. And I've seen that too, although I don't have one handy to show you. So in either case, these are uh, kind of an odd, relatively uncommon thing, but benign. But if you find a benign lesion that's got all these different hair follicle components together, think of panfolliculoma. And then finishing up here, I'll show you one last kind of rare, rare uh, thing as a treat, something we rarely ever encounter. I think this case was courtesy of uh, Dr. Nigel Ball from Vancouver. 
uh, sent this case to me uh, for uh, teaching sat. So this dermis is a little funny looking. That's like pseudoxanthoma elasticum type of look. It does kind of resemble pseudoxanthoma elasticum. It's slightly different, but very, very similar. And I, I mean, oh, it's the um, penis lemon induced. Yeah, good. This we've got these funny, like elastic fibers here that have little jagged thorns coming out of them, right? The so-called bramble, bush, bramble like bush, which for a long time I didn't know what a bramble bush was. There's lots of names like this in Dermpath because there are people who describe them use different terms for plants and, and things in real life than I do. Bramble bushes, brambles are blackberries and raspberries, right? So I actually did pull up a, a picture here on Wikipedia. You can see who, who took the picture down here. And even though it's focused on the berry, look at the the long stem in the background with thorns sticking out of both sides. So I think that's actually a pretty apt description. Bramble bush pattern of elastic fibers here, all tangled up and disorganized in the dermis. And here is the elastic stain, the VVG stain, to highlight that same pattern. And you can see very nicely that this is this is what this is. These are tangled up elastic fibers that have kind of elongated and have the little thorns sticking out. So this is the uh, associated with, it's called penicillamine uh, dermopathy, I think is the name that's given to this. And um, penicillamine, if you have a, on a test, if you have a question about what drug causes this, the, the answer to guess is penicillamine, because penicillamine causes this enormously long laundry list of different types of things, including it can make lesions that look like PXE, pseudoxanthoma elasticum. It can make these kind of, it does all sorts of different abnormalities to collagen and uh, elastic tissue because it causes like unusual, I think, cross-linking or something in the proteins. Um, and penicillamine is used a lot of times for people with Wilson's disease because I think it's a chelating agent and helps you know, take down their copper levels. And it can be used for treating metal, he uh, heavy metal exposure, stuff like that. I I've, I've never like used it or, or I mean, it, only something I learned about in med school and in training and rarely ever encounter. This is a perfect example. And while we're, while we're showing this, um, and this patient actually was a Wilson's disease patient, I believe, and was uh, on a long-term uh, penicillamine therapy. So that's the penicillamine uh, changes that you can see in elastic fibers. Now you've seen that, and I did pull out for comparison an example of pseudoxanthoma elasticum, just to compare. The, the slight difference is that the, see the elastic fibers in the dermis and the reticular dermis are all messed up. You can see them, they're all tangled up. But instead of those kind of long things, long branches with little thorns, these are like little curly cues, little tangled, swirled, um, uh, bunched up aggregates. They're a little bit more tangly looking. I don't know if that's the, they're squinched up, if that, that's the medical technical word for it. And also the other thing is that these get a little bit of a purple color because they often, these elastic fibers often get calcified a little bit. And if you stain them with von Casa stain, a calcium phosphate stain, um, it will highlight these in addition to the VVG. So um, again, you can still have uh, patients on penicillin. You can still get pseudoxanthoma elasticum change. There are people that have a germline genetic mutation. I believe it's uh, ABCC6. Is that right? I'll edit this out if I'm wrong. But I, I, I looked it up earlier. But that some people have it as a germline problem, and they can get uh, cardiac involvement and, uh, I believe, ocular involvement. Although it varies from person to person. It's got a lot of phenotypic heterogeneity. But also you can see changes that look like PXE in a variety of other settings that are non-syndromic. So once you see this, then they need to figure out if the patient actually has PXE or not. But uh, there's a variety of times I've seen these changes, like incidentally under a squamous cell carcinoma. Uh, there's a weird periumbilical form uh, that perforates. There's a lot of different things that can make this pattern. And I don't have a stain here to show you, but you can look up pictures um, on, um, in a book and see uh, to see what the uh, von Casa stain looks like. But basically, um, imagine those and turn them brown, and that's what it looks like, okay? So that's a pen, uh, um, pseudoxanthoma elasticum PXE as a contrast against the penicillamine dermopathy, which is the bramble bush appearance. All right, well, we did it in an hour and three minutes, and we got through about a dozen cases. So uh, any questions, guys? Well, thank you very much. I hope you enjoyed, and for anyone watching at home, uh, thanks for watching. Have a great day.